Carlos is um, pro probably one of the well is one of the most respected cycling journalists in, in Europe, if not the world. He has a beautiful literary style, and um, is somebody who has a lot of contacts in Spain, a lot of contacts in cycling, has been covering the tour since the early 1990s. He was the man who published the first stories about Operation Porto in El Pais back in 2006. And he and I have continued to sort of discuss the case and work together in trying to piece together the various bits of it since that time. My, my, my PhD actually takes up some of the work that Carlos and I have been doing on this. The title, if I can call it a title, is, um, is we, were trans we were trying to tr put a nice Spanish phrase into English before, but it wasn't quite so easy, is that we must abhor the crime, but we need to have some com compassion with the criminal. So let's just go back and talk about Operation Porto. The police intervention in Madrid against a doping network was a result of one detective's curiosity. A Spanish Guardia Civil police lieutenant who had broken up a few gangs for counterfeiting and for the wholesale distribution of anabolic steroids originated from an Australian government funded company based in Adelaide, GrowPet, which was producing human growth hormone and it was being imported into Spain and this was a human growth hormone that was ending up in Dr. Fuentes' uh, surgery. <coughs> The judge, the police lieutenant approached the judge to allow him to undertake some phone taps and surveillance of Eufemio Fuentes, the most renowned sports doctor in Spain. And the consequences of his findings overcame him, overwhelmed him. But the judge's lack of enthusiasm to unravel all the secrets of Fuentes paralyzed him. His were not political interpretations, and he was left with the feeling of an unfinished work which either neither the national or international sporting authorities didn't want to complete. He just kept on unveiling the secret life of elite athletes to the public. The keys to a world that unaltered, untouched, four and a half years later is still going on and is still run by the same people. Lieutenant Enrique has now become a captain. He's destined to go to Afghanistan, or he is in Afghanistan, where he now works with the intelligence, the UN intelligence. Probably another Spanish Guardia Civil team is currently phone tapping, doing surveillance and intercepting the calls of Fuentes and other doctors. Some implicated riders have been sanctioned and have returned to race. Others are still riding without ever being sanctioned. Others are suspended at the moment. Others retired and have no team as no team would hire them. Others have tested, tested positive were sanctioned and have not come back. Others spoke out, some are writing books, given interviews, have re repented, broken the code of silence and haven't been accepted again. Others continue in limbo, racing for hardly any money in small teams afar in exotic places and exotic races. At noon on the 23rd of May, Paco Mensebo feels that his life has changed forever when he hears on a Spanish radio station the reports of the arrest of Fuentes, Manolo Saez and others, as well as the discovery of dozens of bags of blood in two flats in Madrid. Soon after, a friend telephones Mansebo, who, really, who is in his home in Geneva. I'm fucked up, really fucked up, says the writer. A few weeks ago I was at Euphemia's preparing blood for the tour. I left there a couple of bags. His whole career, Mansebo's life, is reduced to the two bags plus a few more he has left ready in recent months. And suddenly he's plunged into a skeptical and paralyzing stupor where from, where, from where Louisa, his wife, tries to pull him out. Something must be done, he says. Something can be done. I will. Louisa thinks. At this point, no writer's name had been revealed. And despite that in the cycling scene, everybody knows that Mansebo is one of them. Fuentes' customers, they could still prevent his name from being made public if he cooperates with the investigation. A few days later, through the Spanish Sports Department, Mansebo gets in contact, contact with Enrique, the lieutenant, 
who had started the phone taps some months before, just like in the wire, monitoring, intercepting, investigating the movements of Fuentes and his friends. Who would lead, all of this would lead to Operation Puerto. Mancebo joined him a couple of times. He helped him to interpret some of the documents to the records, to unravel the keys behind the hidden substances prescribed by the physician to dozens of cyclists. He tells him more about his life. You can see some of the Puerto files before us. This stuff needs interpretation. If you don't know what the symbols mean, if you don't go through all of the documents, you can't work out what was going on. He tells him a few years before, his team director tired of watching them, always He tells him, sorry, that a few years before, his team director, tired of watching him always finishing no better than 6th or 7th in, in the races like the Tour de France or Vuelta de Spania, despite his class and capacity for, for suffering, said to him one day, Paquito, you have to go to the doctor. The doctor decides who wins the race. The doctor decides the general classification of the Vuelta, the Giro. Those ones who don't go with, with him are not worth a damn. Paquito goes to see the doctor. Fuentes makes him sit in a chair and asks him, how long do you have to finish your contract? Two years. So the first year we'll take it easy, without risk. And then on the second, we'll enter into all the array. He prescribes him anabolic steroids, beans, the code is in the, in the files, for the winter. Then EPO from January onwards, and HME, HMG, power, for the big stages. The first time that he took Andriol, the anabolic steroid, Parker could not sleep at night, thinking that on the next morning, an inspector from the UCI could come and test him. Nobody comes. And although Fuentes tries to calm him down, saying there is no danger, he threw all the pills away. Despite all the treatments, despite all the wreaths, Mancebo didn't improve his performance. He stayed the same. He didn't get worse. He stayed where he was. With him, the myth breaks. Mancebo doesn't win, and nor does he win anything big the following year, when he has already begun to receive the blood transfusions. One day he goes to Fuentes' office, who makes him take a seat and extracts more than one litre of blood from him. That's all, he says. When the tour starts, this blood will be waiting for you in Mimosis, on the day off. That's how I organise it. I have partners. They take charge of everything. You don't have to worry about a thing. Paco tells everything to Enrique who transcribes it all and gives it back to him to sign as an official statement for the records. But Mancebo refuses to sign, says he's nothing against Fuentes, he voluntarily visited him, that he paid him regularly for the treatment, so why should he betray him? So Mancebo lost his immunity because he wouldn't sign a statement that on the other hand did little to help the investigation. Enrique, the Spanish police lieutenant, must build a case of a crime against public health. Remember at this time, doping was not a crime in Spain. And to, do, to, do, to build his case, he needs to prove that the patients, the athletes, have had their lives put at risk by following the advice of Fuentes. Mancebo could not help with that. He couldn't invent an ana, anaphylactic shock, sorry about the pronunciation there, an allergic reaction, an illness related to the use of substances delivered by Fuentes, or caused by transfusion carried out not in health facilities but in hotels, private rooms and train station toilets. Inevitably, Mancebo's name appears within the list of dozens of cyclists of Enrique's first report. This hasty, clumsy report is not produced by the Guardia Civil at the re request of the judge, who doesn't care about the names of the cyclists, and receive blood, but at the request of the organisers of the Tour de France. <laughs>